Good morning. It is good to see you today. Uh, hopefully that feeling is mutual as you get to church each week and you, you see each other and you come in. And for some of you, uh, you can't wait to come to church. And some of you might be here begrudgingly because a spouse or someone else brought you here. But whatever got you in the room, I hope you enjoy this morning. I hope you have the chance to connect with other people and be encouraged, whether you're having the best week of your life or the hardest. Hopefully you find someone in this room that can be of support to you and encouragement, because that is what we're called to be as a body of believers. We're actually supposed to show up in each other's lives and have an impact. So hopefully that's happening for you today. Uh, if not, hopefully that changes by the end of the service. Uh, it's, it's an honor to come here every once in a while to share on behalf of Bethany Kids and to give the chance to preach a sermon. So uh, before we get into our passage, I'd like to just give a, a quick pitch for Bethany Kids. Uh, for those of you who, who are not aware, uh, Bay Park and Bethany Kids have been partnered for a very long time in different ways. Uh, and we, you have allowed us to do some extraordinary things on the continent of Africa. As Bethany Kids, we train pediatric surgeons who are from Africa and who go on to serve within Africa. So these people are missionally minded, people who are gospelly centered, who go to their home countries, who are now equipped to be surgeons, to transform lives in beautiful and meaningful ways so that children have an opportunity to live and thrive. Uh, not only do we train those surgeons as, as physicians or, uh, we'll say, clinically as pediatric surgeons, but we train them to truly be evangelists and disciples of Jesus. And the, the byproduct of that is that each and every year we not only provide thousands of surgeries to children who otherwise would be in very difficult circumstances, but those uh, relationships also form and so many of those children begin to follow Jesus for the first time. So last year, as just some quick examples, 5,000 children received surgery through Bethany Kids uh, across, at the time, seven countries. Since that time, we've moved into nine countries uh, in just in the last six months. Uh, in the last year, again, of those children, 555 began to follow Jesus for the very first time. That's an awful lot of children. I think about how beautiful it was to see these amazing kids here, and you imagine 555 kids being added to a church every single year. That's powerful. It's amazing. And this church has allowed us to, to do that. Uh, not only that, if 555 kids begin to follow Jesus, but of those kids, uh, over 430 of them, we've been able to connect them to a church in their local community so they can continue in discipleship relationships. So that is the work of Bethany Kids. We, we exist in a place where we provide uh, transformative medical care, but we also recognize that we are whole people. So not only do we uh, seek to bring physical healing, but we understand it as a whole person, physical, spiritual, emotional, all of it, and we try to care for the children before us. So thank you for being part of that as a church. Thank you for your missions committee, for your senior pastor, for the whole team. We're just so blessed to be able to work with you. And if you find yourself today thinking, I've never heard of this, or, or I know my church supports this, but I would like to do so personally, I want to be very clear today that one of my goals or hopes is that some of you might join myself and others in this room as a monthly donor by the end of the day, maybe by the end of the service. Um, uh, this morning when I woke up, there were 83 monthly donors in Canada total. It's not a big number for 5,000 surgeries. There's 83 monthly donors in Canada. Uh, and my encouragement to the first service was maybe we can get to 90 today. And a few of them stepped up and visited me at the booth at the back. So if that's you, I would love to see you uh, just after the service, and maybe we can get you signed up to help us in this work. So that said, um, I don't want to get kicked off the stage, so we better get to the passage of Scripture for today. Uh, we're looking at the Gospel of John. Uh, John, uh, and there's this beautiful story of him interacting with a woman at the well. So I invite you to follow along on the screens or follow along in your Scripture, uh, John 4, uh, and we'll see what takes place here. Uh, if, if you've never been to church before, uh, you may be aware that we believe in the Bible. <laughs> it's kind of a big thing for us. But the Bible points to Jesus and this incredible word-made life. So Jesus really is the center of every story. And so this passage talks about Jesus having a conversation with someone. And it's one of the longest recorded conversations between Jesus and anyone in the Gospel of John. And it's with uh, this woman at the well that we're going to uh, meet today. So Anytime something happens the biggest or the longest or the furthest, it feels like it's worth paying attention to. So we're going to read the story as Jesus interacts with the woman at the well. This is how it starts. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea, and he went back once more to Galilee. Uh, now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, and near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. 
this kind of gives us a bit of context. Jesus is coming into this place called Samaria. His disciples have been baptizing people, which, which should be interesting to us because uh, these disciples are clueless literally half the time as you read the scriptures. They often don't know what they're doing. They're mistaken about Jesus' identity. And even at the last moment when Jesus is going to the cross, you've got like deniers and betrayers and uh, the whole lot of them. And yet in the midst of that, Jesus had invited these uh, half-formed disciples to participate in mission and be part of the baptism process. It's beautiful. Because sometimes we think, I would love to help, but I'm not there yet. I, I don't have the skills or the talents or the whatever. The difference between these disciples and m- many of us is not so much that they had profound talent. It was that they actually said yes when Jesus said, come and follow me. And, and that, to me, is an encouragement because it's not about our perfection or our skills, but our willingness to say yes that truly transforms the world. And, and these were the disciples who, again, you'll see even in this passage, weren't the brightest bulbs. So they are following Jesus, baptizing. That's pretty cool. And it says this happened at about the time of noon or the sixth hour. Again, I think maybe, I don't want to put too much on this one, but I think that could be important because the only other time the Gospel of John, that phrase is used, is at the crucifixion when Pilate says, like, this is your king. And they're like, no, crucify him. We don't want anything to do with this guy. And so here at the moment of crucifixion, you have a people en masse reject Jesus as king. And I think the opposite happens here when he's in Samaria, the people en masse, not not to give too many spoilers. But something really cool happens by the end of the story, a big contrast to people declaring for his crucifixion. So that's all interesting to me. The big story, I think, here is that Jesus is in Samaria. And Samaria is not where you would normally go as a Jewish person. This is Uh, the forbidden city. This is not where you belong. There is tension, uh, ethnic and religious and social tension between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Uh, You you think of stories like the good Samaritan, and we've sort of normalized this term as uh, the good guys. That is not how the good Samaritan would have been heard initially, and nor this story. Anyone reading this letter or this gospel written by John and hearing this sign of And then they went through Samaria. It's like, oh, this isn't going to end well. This is a bad idea. Jesus, don't go there. This is the wrong call for you, right? That that is, I think, how we're meant to understand it. For the Jewish people, not only was there deep history, if if you're, uh, many of you are biblical scholars, but you'll be aware that the Samaritans were kind of the leftovers uh, when the Israelites were taken into exile and a few people were left behind. And usually when uh, kingdoms want to destroy national identity, what they do is they move one population and mix them all up so that everyone loses their sense of identity intentionally. This wasn't an accident. And so the Assyrian Empire moved a bunch of people in. They married up with the leftover Judeans. The Samaritans were born as a people. Small group of people. Over the centuries, there was this religious tension with the, uh, with the Israelites. And also there was violence, like people killing each other. So like this was... Not like, oh, it's the wrong side of the tracks. Really, this is, this is a problem for Jesus to wander through here. And anyone reading this passage of Scripture would be like, oh, boy. Like, this, is, this should be surprising. And it's difficult if you've grown up in the church to continue to be surprised each and every Sunday. So that's why I'm just trying to really point out, for anyone reading this text in its original form would have gone, oh, Oh, and, and I think we're meant to do the same. Like, oh, goodness, what's about to happen here? So it's about noon. Jesus rolls up in the forbidden city in Samaria, and then this takes place. He meets somebody and says this. You'll see it on the next slide. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, uh, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answers her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was or who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. That's a beautiful thing for Jesus to say. But I want to pause and just think about who he's talking to right now, this extended conversation with a Samaritan woman. I already argued that to talk to a Samaritan was scandalous enough. And now he's talking to a woman. And again, this is a scandal for the day and age. I know some of you here just because... I, who I know in this room, have lived in the Middle East, and you understand that different worlds and different societies understand genders mixing in very different ways. In Canada, it's like, yo, what's up? No boundaries. That is not the case for every country in history or in geography of the world today. For men and women to mix was very problematic. 
I live in a country for a very long time where there would be men and women's lines, not just for the washrooms, but for hospitals. Or even there would be times at a, at a mall where it was only women allowed in the mall. It was women only hours in the mall. So this idea of men and women not mixing, while it might be foreign to some of us, this was really important to the first century people who read this. So they're scandalized by Jesus talking to any Samaritan. This is like, whoa, <laughs> you've crossed the line. And Jesus is like, let's cross a few more. I'm talking to a Samaritan woman at the same time. Anyone reading this story initially is like, oh boy, like what happens next? This is not normal. So I, that's, hopefully that's clear to you. And then what I think is interesting is Jesus starts his first words to her, like, hey, can you hook me up? Like, I'm thirsty. Can you help? Again, it's like, that's weird. You, you're a, you know, there's a gender balance, a difference of power here where Jesus is this Jewish man, this rabbi, and he's like, hey, would you help me out? Like, I'm thirsty. And I, I, I read it, at least, as there's this humbling moment of Jesus not coming and be like, hey, real quick, you might not know, but I'm kind of a big deal. Like, I just left the last town because I was such a big deal. So, please, ask me your questions because I'm that good. That's not how he starts. He's just like, hey, I'm thirsty. Like, that's a human, <laughs> a shared human experience that's going to cross boundaries of gender and politics and ethnicity. And it's like, hey, I'm kind of thirsty. Do you, do you mind, like, helping me? And her reaction, pretty normal, is like, we shouldn't even be talking. Like, this can't be happening. Someone's going to get us in trouble. Like, this is not acceptable, not normal, not okay. Uh, and, and then Jesus is like, uh, well, listen, if you knew who I was, uh, living water, and it's like, what now? Like, living water? You're the guy who just can't even feed him, get himself water from the well, but you're living water? So he lays out something that's obviously going to be surprising and strange to her, and it, and it continues in a, in a beautiful way. Um, and it says this, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Uh, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? That's a pretty normal reaction, isn't it? Like, where, where are you getting your water from? Jesus answered her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. If you've ever come across the scriptures before, you know that Jesus and, and people like Paul who wrote some of the, the letters, they love lots and lots of metaphors. They just make them up all the time. Every passage is like, here we got food, we got water, we got seeds, like agriculture. And they're standing at a well. So I, I mean, maybe he put a lot of thought into this ahead of time. He's Jesus probably. But also, standing at a well, having a conversation about water, this feels like a pretty natural metaphor to talk about, right? You're standing at the well like, hey, you thirsty? Me too. Speaking of which, you know, like that's just a natural kind of maybe, yeah, it's natural. And he says, I, I'm water. And, and her reaction, normal, like, hey, uh, pretty literally, if you are the source of water, why are you asking me for a drink? And one of the things that I think about in this particular passage is uh, many times when Jesus uses these metaphors, the, the listening audience goes to the literal every time. Uh, and uh, we talked earlier this morning about Nicodemus, who, uh, when Nicodemus, this other guy coming to Jesus with questions, and he, Jesus is like, hey, so for you, what's the metaphor today? Oh, be born again. And Nicodemus is like, <laughs> uh, problem, I can't fit back inside my mother's womb. Like, that's, that's not going to work. That you know, very literal response, right? <laughs> like, born again, no, it's not going to happen. It's just, it's not going to happen. Here again, there's a reaction to Jesus' words. He gives this metaphor like, I am the source of all life, and, and I'm water itself. I quench thirst. And the woman's like, yeah, but like, so why don't you get your own water? Like, you know what I mean? Like, we're very literal people. Jesus is talking about big picture stuff here. And, and it's brilliant. I think this, the imagery of water is, I, I don't want to rank Jesus' metaphors, but it's one of my favorites. I don't know if you've got a favorite metaphor from Jesus, but it's great. If you ever get thirsty, you know just how much you need water, and you're like, man, this is going to change everything. But if you've ever been dehydrated, something really weird happens. When you get dehydrated, you stop feeling thirsty. Have you ever experienced that kind of thirst? Where you, you, you know you need water, maybe you're in a very hot climate, or you're running very far, and you're like, the, the taste of water, you're like, I, I'm not thirsty. You're like, your body knows you need it, but your head is like, nah, I'll pass. And let's be honest, with, with spirituality, that happens a lot. Sometimes we so 
are in such need of transforming influence in our lives, such need of God in our lives, but we're going, ah, I'm thirsty. Do you want some water? No, that's not it. It's something else. You, you sure you don't want water? No, it's got to be something else. You know what I mean? Like, there's something powerful about the imagery of water to me. Anyways, maybe I'm going on about that one. But this is, how they, this is what happens next. Jesus says, well up into her life. And the woman said to her, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, go back, uh, go call your husband and come back. I'll uh, we'll pause there really quickly. Uh, again, very little co- uh, comment from the woman. Uh, if, if you can give me this water. Also, a high degree of trust. If you met someone on the street sometime, and they're like, hey, man, like, I got this stuff. If you take it, you'll never be hungry again. And you're going, yeah, I'll give that, I'll give that whirl. <laughs> so she's got a high degree of trust, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing sometimes. But there's something wonderful happening. Maybe she already has a sense of just who Jesus is and the kind of person she's talking to. Because to be honest... If I met someone on the street that I didn't know from another country who shouldn't be talking to me and was like, I got this snake oil. It's going to heal everything. It's an essential oil. It's going to heal everything. Just join my pyramid scheme and, like, it's going to be great. Honestly, my reaction would be like, no, thank you. Like, no. But she's like, yeah, if you've got cool water, I'll take it. And so he says, oh, great. Why don't you go back, uh, call your husband, bring him back here. And this, this, uh, creates a, an interesting follow-up to that conversation. And before we get to that follow-up of, of what her reaction is to his statement, I want to say that his comment here is super normal. I've already argued that things like talking to a Samaritan or talking to a woman would have been abnormal or, or strange, and we should have like a, oh, this is weird. Him saying to a woman in the Middle East 2,000 years ago, hey, we probably shouldn't keep talking without your husband around, that's totally normal. That, uh, that would be a very normal thing to say. And so sh- he says, hey, well, bring your husband. That's not judgy. That's just like, hey, you know, we're going to have this conversation. Bring along your husband. And she replies, I have no husband. Um, and it, it continues. And see, see what happens next here. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husbands. The fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Um, I don't know how often you've heard someone preach on this sermon. Uh, I feel like I've heard it a lot in my life. And every time I hear it, it seems like this woman gets a really bad rap. Now, you can read what's on the phrase, uh, screen about her, but the interpretation that, like, every time I show up to church and hear this sermon is like, boy, did she get around. I mean, this woman was the worst. And we, like, pile on this poor lady of, like, wow, a scandal. You know, even, like, the only reason she went to get water in the middle of the day was because no one wanted to talk to her. I've heard that in many, many sermons. It doesn't say that. We could infer that, but it doesn't say it. It, it says, what, just very specifically, she's, she's had a bunch of husbands, and she's with someone who's not her husband right now. Now, hear me out. Probably, maybe something's been going on. Maybe she's sleeping around. Maybe that's what's happening. But I, what is clear to me, or what's important to state, is it doesn't actually say that. There's, there's certainly a chance that she's just a victim of terrible circumstances. Like every time she gets married, the person dies in battle or by disease. And because of Jewish law, uh, as soon as she gets married into a family, like the next brother in line has to marry her. And maybe this fifth brother's like, dude, you killed the other four. I'm not, you know, you're a curse. I'm, we're not doing this. And hear me out. I'm not saying that's definitely what happened. But it's interesting to me that as a society, even as a church, our definition of this woman has consistently for like 2,000 years been like, she was a bad one. Like, she's the worst, you know? She's been sleeping around with the whole town. And it's interesting because Jesus doesn't even go there with her. Like, that's not his emphasis. That's not what happens after this is beautiful and transformative. And he, like, lifts her up and she does cool things. It's a tragedy that we look at her and go, the worst. Because let's be honest, that's sometimes how we see people. Rather than seeing what God is capable of turning them into, we're like, boy, but what a past. I mean, the worst. That, that is not who she is. She is defined by Christ and her relationship with Christ and the fact that she's transformed. Um, so, anyways, I want to say that if, if you have heard a sermon before that's, like, really dragged this woman through the mud, Jesus doesn't. So maybe we should stop, right? Anyway, so he, he, she's with this person. This continues. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. 
Uh, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Uh, I want to pause and again critique some other sermons, so forgive me, because you'll do this about my sermon. You'll make fun of it or something, maybe. But I, I really get upset when I hear sermons say that this woman was trying to change the subject and was, like, so uncomfortable about personal conversations. Like, how demeaning to a woman asking a really, really good question, right? She's talking to a Jew. No Samaritan gets to talk to a Jew ever. This guy's clearly, like, knows stuff. She, he, he knows things about me no one else knew, and she's like, I don't think she's deflecting or trying to pre- prevent him from knowing things about herself. She just declared, or we, she will declare, he knew everything about me. She asks a really good question. Like, hey, Jesus, everyone's wondering. Like, our two people have been separated over this issue for centuries. You say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And we say we're supposed to worship on this mountain. It's so like, what's the deal? Like, this, what a great question. And Jesus honors that question. And if you've read enough of the passages of Jesus talking to people, sometimes they ask him questions to deflect or defer or trap him. And half the time he doesn't answer those questions. Jesus gives a very good reaction. Like he, he answers this fully as if it's a true question. So whether you think she's trying to deflect from her personal circumstances or whether you think she's just asking great theological questions, which I think she's doing, Jesus answers it. And it's a good answer. And it's like, listen... Here's the thing. There's coming a time, and it's now come, where it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. You, the, the things that we've defined, these separations, though, I'm in Jerusalem, you're in Samaria, it stops mattering. You don't have to go to the temple because we're becoming the temple. You don't have to go to a special place because God has come from his throne and, and is now here, the word made life. This is amazing. Something transformative is happening. This is, to me, this is great. She asks a really good question that's very specific to her circumstances, and Jesus answers it honestly and truthfully. And then this line of, like, there will come a day where, you know, uh, we will worship God in spirit and in truth. And that is not just, like, we're going to sing cool songs and it will feel nice, but we're actually going to see and declare that God is God and we follow him regardless of where we are, regardless of where we're, whether we're in the temple on a Saturday in Jerusalem or at a well in Samaria on a Wednesday. Like, we're just, now we have the chance to experience God everywhere. That's powerful. For a woman who for so long was told, you can't get close to God because he's up on the mountain over there. And that's, you can't go there. Especially as a woman and as a Samaritan, you, you can't, that, it's off limits. You can't. For a lot of reasons, you can't get close to him. And yet the God that we know in Jesus Christ showed up at her well and said, well, I'm here. What are your questions? It's powerful. I think it's beautiful. And this is what happens after that. They've had this beautiful moment where a good question is answered, and this is what takes place in this story. It's always um, beautiful. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declares, I, the one speaking to you, am he. There's a lot of times that Jesus has encounters with really powerful people or other wonderful, interesting people, and he just never admits who he is. He, very rarely, you know, if you read the Gospels, it's like half the time he's like, he just, he deflects. And this woman who he shouldn't have been talking to in a place he shouldn't have been talking to, uh, he's like, yo, by the way, that Messiah that you're waiting for, I'm here. Like, it's me. And it's beautiful. And th- you would expect the next line to be about her transformation, but here's, here's what takes place next. Um, just then his disciples, the goofballs that they are, returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Of course they were. Uh, but no one asked, uh, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Uh, then leaving the water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, uh, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat and that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could, he have, could someone have brought him food? They're not always there, these guys. Uh, My food, said Jesus, is to, to, the will, to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still the four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now. The one who reaps, draws a wage, and a harvest, a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. 
Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. And I sent you to reap what you have not worked for, and others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Lots happening there. A couple things that strike me. Maybe this strikes you as well. Immediately after hearing uh, Jesus says, I am he, the disciples kind of stumble onto the scene. Hey, lunchtime, everybody. Uh, let's see, you hungry? I'm hungry. And Jesus is like, yo, kind of having a moment here. You know, something important's happening. Lunchtime, are you hungry? But food, a bread of life, man, this guy must have eaten already. Like, missing the point. The woman, however, hears him declare that he is the one that they've been waiting for. He's Messiah. And it says that she immediately leaves her water jar and goes. She leaves. Like, immediate reaction from her. If you're familiar with church language, you know this word repent. We use it a lot in church. Sometimes I think we misuse it to say repenting is to say sorry to somebody. Repenting in the ancient world had a lot more to do with changing your direction. I was going here uh, for a Jewish person in, uh, in the first century. Repent broadly meant I was on a journey walking this direction. I hit something in the road and I turned around and went a new way. For a Roman or for a Hellenistic person, it was more about politics. We used to follow this Caesar. Well, you know, that Caesar's dead. There's a new Caesar. So now I'm repenting. I'm following the new king. This woman immediately stops in her tracks. She hears that he's declared king, and she goes back to her community and tells him all about it. Hey, there's this guy who knew everything about my life. He, he knew who I was. Like, could he be the Messiah? Like, come and see. Contrast that to the disciples who were like, bread of life. Man, is he, is he smuggling food? Like, is he... Where's the food from? Like, they're just very little. Anyways, I don't want to dog on them too much. But I think this woman is incredible. To me, there's this incredible moment of transformation that she has on day one of her experience with Christ. Where she meets him. He, they have this profound conversation where uh, it's revealed that he knows everything. So she asks, like, some really good uh, theological questions. And then he's like, hey, also, I'm he. I'm, I'm the Messiah. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. I'm going to tell everybody. Some of us have sat in pews in church for 20 years, and we've not told anybody, right? There's a contrast that I, that I think is probably pretty important, not just for today, but even for the early readers of this text 2,000 years ago, that some of us, like the disciples, sit around going, what's for lunch? And some people, like the woman, go, wow, this is good news, and it's transformative. And because of what I've heard today, I'm going to tell everyone that I know. Jesus invested in that woman right there in that moment, and an entire village was transformed. Now, in the last few moments that I have, I want to talk about Bethany Kids for a second. Because anywhere I go, uh, my, one of my primary purposes is to invite you to think about becoming a donor, a supporter to Bethany Kids. So I want to be very clear that pitch is coming right now. And on the screen, you'll see a photo of a brilliant woman. This woman is Francesca. Uh, some of you, if you've been part of Beth, uh, Bethany Kids or connected, you would have heard her story. Because she may have even been here like 10 years ago. She visited Kingston uh, a long time ago. Uh, she's an amazing woman. When she was born, she was born with spina bifida, and her community saw her as a curse. They tried to murder her when she was young because of what she had that she couldn't control. Her, her life going into her teenage years was so difficult. In her own words, she wished that her grandparents had been successful to take her life because it was so miserable that every day of her entire life, she was wet with her own urine. No one wanted to talk to her, sit with her, or see her for the person that she was. When she encountered the people of Bethany Kids, the founding surgeon of Bethany Kids, something amazing happened. Not only did he identify the medical condition that was the problem, it was the first time she'd ever heard the word spina bifida, not only did, she, did he identify the medical problem, but he saw her, he looked her in the eyes, and that alone was transformative for her. So not only did she begin to uh, move in, in the abilities that she had in, medically, but also she was transformed and she started to follow Jesus. Uh, and like this woman in the story, she, in, in effect, dropped the water jar and started to follow Jesus in, in his teachings. So that now here you see her, this is 15 years later, she's teaching kids about Jesus in a school in uh, rural Kenya. Her life was transformed. She didn't just sit on it, but she allowed it to transform her own life to spread the gospel to others. And she's been doing that uh, for nearly a decade with Bethany Kids as a staff person. When I invite you or invite this church to participate with Bethany Kids, I'm saying there are incredible human beings like this. And every one of those 5,000 or so surgeries we did last year are children whose lives have been transformed 
pointed to Christ and have the potential to be like that Samaritan woman who goes out and tells her whole village, I was once sick and now I can walk because of this Jesus. I'm inviting you to partner with that. I said at the beginning there's some 83 people who, as of first thing this morning, were monthly donors to Bethany Kids. If I were to imagine five or seven more people uh, today were to join me, maybe some of you are thinking, I could do $200 a month, and some of you are going, $5 a month is more my pay scale. Um, imagine, as a community, that would mean that another five, six children every single month going forward has access to surgery that is Jesus-centered. So if you have it in your means, you have the capacity to help, I would encourage you, urge you, beg you, plead you, come and see me at the booth out that door. I'll happily sign you up as a monthly donor. Or you can go online. The website will be on the screen. You can go online and donate uh, there. We need your participation in this gospel. Um, this room can continue to be a transforming influence on the world. Step back from Bethany Kids for a second, and let me just say this. Uh, being a transforming influence in the world is not just about giving money to someone else. Uh, what it was powerful in this story, and I think a fair application is to give overseas, sure, but what was powerful in this story is the way Jesus interacted with someone he should never have been talking to, probably a life lesson there for us. There are some people who are in this very city that we don't talk to. We don't look in the eyes. We don't cross the street. And I would urge you and encourage you, especially as you consider new services and expanding, that the way that that happens is you actually talk to your neighbors about how your life was transformed the way this woman did. Because when we do that, exponential change happens. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity as Christians to gather so freely and openly in this country. Thank you for Bay Park and for the faithfulness they have to ministry in this city and around the globe. We, we can't even begin to think of all the numbers of families and children that have been affected because of this church in this city and globally. God, I pray that as your people...